What up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to talk about happy front-end development in Elm. Jesse Warden. This presentation is heavily based off of Jeremy Fairbanks' Tame the Front-end with Elm, and he talked about this four years ago. So it's been a long time, and a lot has changed with the front-end world, but not a lot has changed with Elm, and it's benefits to the front end world. So I thought that was fascinating and perfect time to rekindle a lot of what Jeremy was talking about and dive more in depth with my take on some of the JavaScript comparisons. So he's, if you don't know Jeremy Fairbanks, he's a smart guy. He actually works at Test Double. Justin Serials is probably another person you've heard from Test Double. He's one of the best speakers around testing and test room development and mocks and things like that from Ruby and JavaScript. Jeremy Fairbank, he's also a very good speaker about that. But his take on Elm was wonderful because it was all about the basics and the benefits. And if you're looking, he's actually got a book I bought. It's fantastic. It's called Programming in Elm and very good. Even though I, by the time I bought this, I actually knew a lot of Elm. I still managed to learn stuff and I just, I like the way he writes too. So definitely recommend it. So why I wanted to talk about this is I, I think a lot of people don't realize what Elm can offer. So I, my promise to you is after the end of watching this, feeling confident in Elm, you'll be more confident in your front end web development. You'll no longer worry about runtime errors. And you'll be able to refactor confidently as you learn more about your users and how they use your application. So that's my promise after you get through this. That's the value that Elm's gonna bring to you. So one thing he talked about in his presentation was happiness, about taming the front end with Elm and happiness. And I started researching this kind of stuff and looking at psychology articles and the definitions of it. And there's really three. It's more about the positive emotions, the satisfaction and engagement. But let's talk about the first two. So when we talk about the two parts of happiness, it really means more positive emotions than negative. So negative is okay, it's natural, it's normal. There's a lot of brain chemistry around why it has to happen. But if you're in a constant state of more positive emotions than negative, that's considered a state of happiness. And the second is around your satisfaction of life. So if you take all the aspects, faucets of life and rate them from one to 10 and have some kind of rating consistency around that, what is your satisfaction? And so those two things, in front of development, make you question like, what is the things that make it unhappy and make it happy? For example, like what are the things that drive you crazy about it? Because we all like to do front end because we do five minutes worth of work and we get all the credit. Unlike the back end people who do six minutes of the work and none of the credit. We're the face of the UI. We actually test their stuff and we find the bugs in their code in the back end just because we're the ones doing hardcore integration tests and actually consuming it. There's so many wonderful benefits of being a front end developer, but what is the burden? And so we're going to talk about those burdens, the things that make it really unhappy to go through from that perspective. What, what takes away from happiness when you're doing front end? So in JavaScript, no types can actually lead to frustration. So for example, we've had this function, load data. What is ID? Is it a number of string? The, the, the quintessential challenge of every front end developer is when they're given an ID from a back end developer. Is it a string or a number? Is it a key to a database? Like, what am I supposed to put there? You don't know. And the whole point of JavaScript and dynamic languages in general is to run super fast, get that feedback loop and identify what it is. But you don't know. So it's, you're already stressed out. Like the first parameter of the function, you don't know. Timestamp. Is it a date timestamp? Is it a string? Like the, the date string that's ISO you have to parse? Is it a number? Like milliseconds of since 1970? Or is it some kind of moment or other moment JS replacement library? Like what, what is that? We don't know. So now already you just kind of don't know. You have to run it. And then the include assets actually is interesting because although it's, we think it's a Boolean, you could include like an object. JavaScript developers are notorious for overloading the parameters of types because that's what you can do. You can make it a Boolean or whatever type. It doesn't matter. So at runtime, you can play around with these things. So th that can cause some stress and burden because you have to run the code to figure it out. You have to read the docs to figure it out. There's no intrinsic built-in way to understand what that is. So going to the other extreme, if you actually had types with something like TypeScript, for example, we can take that same function and go, great, we're gonna have one parameter, it's a request. It's very clear what that is, it's a request type. The return value is one thing, and it is a load data response. So we've simplified things, right? Well, you have to read what those types are. You have to identify what a request is, what an ID is is a number, the timestamp is a date list, so what does that mean, date list? What does that mean, list of dates? It includes assets is, is optional, so it's a Boolean. And so you have to read each one of these enumerators, the address, all the way down, and a lot of that burden is on you to read the code. And so types in general aren't generally perceived as a burden to those who have done dynamic languages, done types, and then come back again. You, it can definitely feel like a refreshing change.
where you can quickly play with code. Even if you're not doing TDD, you're just trying to learn things, play with ideas. And so types are actually a type of burden in some cases, especially if they're hard to work with. And an example of that was Don Syme, who's the creator of F-Sharp. There was a very wonderful GitHub thread that got popularized on Twitter where he was responding to a lot of people wanting higher kind of types for F-Sharp. And if you're not aware, the TLDR for a higher kind of type, I'm not really smart enough to really articulate it well, but think of it like this. Instead of having an array that you have a map method on it, and then a list or a tuple that has a map method, right? So you just read only, you're not like looking at indices of it. And then a sequence, which is an infinite set of things. Each one of those has its own type of map operation. So array.map in JavaScript, that would be like set.map, for example, or map.map, like the actual map. And each one of those has a different implementation because it's on a different data type. Where in higher kind of types, you could have one map function that works for all the types. And to get there, you have to have a lot of crazy type category theory to make that work. And Don, that's what Don was worried about, is that A, they're not acknowledging that adding more and more types adds more and more burden to the code, to the developers. It also excludes people who may not be category theorists, people who aren't enjoying that type of math and type theory, right? Second, it makes the code harder to read. So keep in mind F-sharp is based on OCaml. OCaml's whole shtick claim to fame is its ability to have types that you don't see. The inference is super strong in that, and that you write functions that look very similar to JavaScript or Python, for example. You don't see the types, but they're there, and you can actually add them like kind of like TypeScript. And so here's someone who's working in a strictly type functional language, very similar to Elm, and he's talking about the burden of types. So something to be aware of, which is interesting. You can go both ways. It's just there seems to be a prejudice that people, once they get types, they go, thank God I have it. But they don't really acknowledge that there is work and there is burden to that. And then syntax errors in general. A lot of the syntax errors we get in JavaScript and Python and others just really aren't that good. The, the IDE will also give you red herrings. For example, the IDE is underlined true here. And it's like, is something wrong, is it? Or is it missing a brace? <laughs> right? It's missing a brace. It's, it's supposed to be on line three. But that's not what the IDE is like, oh, true is bad. What's wrong with true? It doesn't say. It says unexpected in input. What is input? I'm not writing text fields. So these kind of things we have to kind of interpret and, and play detective. Some of these things are actually fun. This is why we do programming. We like to solve problems. But some of it's like, dude, this keeps happening. And like, it's been this way for 10 years. Why are things not getting better? Like, this is so obvious at this point. Like, if I know it, the computer should know it better than me. And the biggest one of all is, will I break something? Even if you're practicing test driven development or any type of working hardcore with QA, your, your concern is, will I add some new functionality or feature or modify it and then break something. That trepidation of launching a production, it, it causes stress and stress is very unhealthy and it detracts from happening. And then null pointers, those runtime surprises, undefined is not a function. Whether you're using this for class-based stuff or you're just doing simple functions, all the time we get things that are undefined either in the UI or from a backend and we try to call a method on it or do a dot dot operation and it breaks with an undefined is not a function. It's very frustrating. So null pointers are a big frustrating cause of stress. And then null and refined from user input. So we know about the things that the server sends that we create, but users are notorious for inputting strange things that we might not validate well. And I don't just mean users from us, I mean like users of our API, for example. So if we have a load data function and we know we have to take that request and get an ID off of it to load something from the database, assuming we've sanitized this for cyber concerns, like what if request isn't even there? We, we got some kind of null input and didn't give us a request. That dot's going to call as a runtime exception. Or the request is there, but there's no ID on the query parameters, and it's undefined. So we now have fetch with an undefined in it. Like Those kind of null and undefined user input cause all kinds of problems. It's very frustrating, and it postpones the drama. Because it's not like Python, it doesn't immediately throw an exception around none or finding null like in those kind of use cases. It waits till later, and sometimes later is in a weird place. Like Why is fetch looking for an ID of undefined. <laughs> like you wouldn't know that unless you looked at the code, looked at the logs and looked in the URL. God forbid JavaScript help you, <laughs> right? So those in the un un input kind of sneak their way into UIs too. Like, good morning, undefined. Good morning, null. Like you see that all the time in UI because they just didn't throw an exception. They said, well, that's good enough. Let, let the UI deal with it. And the UI gives a bad user. So it's off. Noah's coalescing tried to fix it, but it just puts a band-aid on the problem because people will sometimes say, all right, well, if it's not there, no big deal, but they don't handle that no big deal. 
So it, they even kick the can further down the road. So I love NOAA's coalition. It's a wonderful feature. It actually shrinks a lot of the code, not checking for null. The key is to ha- still, you still have to handle null. You still have to have responsibility. And a lot of us forget. It's hard to do. Now, try catch is really hard because we've already talked about, and um, a lot of people in many videos have already talked about how try catch from an air handle perspective is just not very good. And that's why in JavaScript, there's no enforcement of it. It's optional. You can do it if you want. And a lot of people in async and wait also don't do it. They sometimes do it as small as possible. So they try catch and just let whatever error happen. We'll figure it out when it runs. There's not really much we can do about it anyway. We don't want to check for error types. And you don't know where that is. So for example, promise, which has built in try catch, I'm doing intentional try catch here to isolate the particular problem because I don't know what data is. I have no idea what the backend's giving me. They change their API. And then building a React app, in this case, we're trying to identify why is the data not named that there. Right? We're seeing situations where it's just not coming back. So we get a response from the server, but we don't know. And we have to, in the finally, do something to provide data. So these try catches on targeted unhappy paths we think are most common, we don't do them everywhere because we assume we got a happy path and we ignore all the other possible scenarios. And that's kind of what your concern is. How much of too much try catch is a bad thing where you, the code is so unreadable and so hard to deal with, but then you don't have try catch on any path that could possibly go wrong. That's bad because then you don't handle it and debugging the error could be in a deeply nested block of code. It's very difficult to debug. And so try catch is just a constant source of drama. It also leads to what is the error? So in nested promise chains or classes that are wired together, you get this error. Where did it come from? Who was the cause? Do I really have to read the stack trace? Just what is it? An example would be in here, we have that targeted path we showed you before. And that's particularly an error on not finding the data name. It's maybe an undefined, for example. But then in the catch of this deeply nested promise chain, we get another error. Is that the same or related? We don't know. We just know that it'll come out maybe. It's something else. So now we have two error scenarios, even with the try catch in a specific area, because we're not following the promise pattern of errors, right? Which is just... Very frustrating. So one way people solve this, at least in the idiomatic, if there is such a word for JavaScript, is we actually create specific error types to look for those common scenarios so we can then respond differently based on those types. Examples of doing this are in REST APIs, for example. So if we have a JSON parse error, that means that something from the upstream is just not working right. It's an JSON API. We get JSON all the time from them and something doesn't parse, right? Like that's really bad. Maybe a proxy server's down, Nginx starts sending back HTML instead of JSON, or we get a proxy error and we get an HTML page from our cybersecurity thing that has nothing to do with our tech stack. So there's reasons for that. And then second could be the server itself. We can't parse the data in the format that we expect, whether it's schema-based or we're doing the whole parse instead of validate, scenario, whatever it is. But each one of those allows us to respond with a specific HTTP code. So we know what error is coming out of this big promise chain or this big composed set of functions and classes, right? Because we can say if the error is of type this, it's kind of like a, a, a poor a JavaScript version of pattern matching on those class types. And if that's the case, we can send back a 503. We're having a problem with upstream or something with the gateway upstream is really bad, right? From an JSON parsing. Otherwise, we have no idea and we're going to send back a 500. So there are scenarios where even that's a burden because now we have to create these error types specific to hand this and generally that's okay but a lot of this stuff is so common with http like why isn't this handled from a type level it's very frustrating fetch for example is now the the de facto way to do stuff in back end node and front end javascript use the fetch api but it's super low level and so you have to handle a lot of those scenarios where it's you didn't get an error but it got your response back and it's like what content type is it it's just a mess and then mocks. Anything to deal with side effects requires so much setup. This is why Justin Searles and all the other people promote pure functions because they're just easier to test. You don't need mocks. You can reduce them out how many stubs you have. Your fixtures hopefully can be small. And then the parts that need side effects, you just test that in one spot. And so it's not this mess that I'm about to show you where you set up a server, you get Shannon to get you one, right? And then you do a callback to get the, f- the fake one loaded in there and insert the callback was actually called. And then later on, you can start asserting against that server. So there's just a lot of setup just to test one function. It's ridiculous. It's very frustrating because if months go by, you have to maintain this code and people get a really negative view around testing. And that's awful. Testing is supposed to be something that you're happy about. It's a part of your tool set, not something that should be hard and frustrating. And I know I'm simplifying it, but that's generally the idea, detracting from happiness. And then I think one of the last big ones is framework fatigue. One of the things that in front-end development for React, for example, it originally started off as this function-based component model. 
which was really, really simple. But the issue was there was no framework around it. It was really just here, we can change data and sync it into your DOM. But how do you create a large scale application? How do you do routing? Basic things that everyone needs to do in HTML applications are not there. And so the community does what they always do best and fill in the blanks with different options, which is fantastic. And one of the authors actually looked at Elm and said, hey, I like the ideas around this. Let's get Redux. So you got Redux. And now we have a state management system that's ported from Elm over to JavaScript. And now React developers can utilize this stuff. The issue is, how do we do async stuff? Because that doesn't really exist in Elm. How do we do, when we click something, it may or may not change the data based on a response. <laughs> and so thunks came out, which are pretty cool, pretty simple, straightforward in terms of promises as best you can make that straight and forward. But then there was no way to do simple rollback if things went wrong for your catch because you would constantly say, if then send this reducer, if catch, modify this data. And that's generally okay, but it's not okay when you're doing a bunch of HTTP calls on the front end to compensate for the lack of a backend for front end or BFF where you're just doing one API call. Sometimes you're a front end developer, you're forced to deal with technical debt and you have to use a bunch of calls. So what do you do? Redux Saga. <laughs> where you can use the saga pattern to orchestrate stuff in generator functions. The downside to that is A, generator functions are hard. Not many people use them, they're not very common, and they're now the core of your framework. Second, testing them is kind of interesting because you have to process them in order, right? You have to call the next, next, next to get them to keep going next lines of code. So testing was very strange, and it just became really hard to use. And so a lot of the problems with JavaScript also is around using immutable data. The benefits of immutable data take a lot of work to do in JavaScript. Even if you use like an immutable JS library or things like that, it just is hard. So they said, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to let you embrace JavaScript. And we're going to create this thing called Imer that allows you to use normal mutation. We'll keep track of what you did and handle the hard parts of immutability for you. And it reminds me so much of... Paul Atreides from Dune, where he you know, works with the Fremen, tries to overthrow the bad dictators. Then he gets injured and becomes a prophet and says, you know, we're, we're now becoming the dictators. <laughs> and that's what Imer reminds me, because he, it completely spits in the face of what Redux is trying to promote, is that immutability and that ease of use of a single place. And Imer's like, no, 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 we, we're doing that. We're handling the immutability for you. We're just encouraging you to do your immutability. It's like, that's not okay. It's like, well, it's not our fault that JavaScript's hard to do it. I'm like, so I just don't, don't like it. But the point is, like, that's what you have to learn, right? Or maybe not. Maybe you don't know any of that. You maybe see the jQuery, and that's fine. But this has changed. One thing to know about React, too, is now they have hooks. So the cool thing about React is their API has stayed pretty much the same. They have a wonderful Surface API that's supported. But now they have, like, two ways to do things. They have the function components. They have the class components. And you can use hooks or not. And that's okay. You know, you can do that. But some people use hooks. Some people use, still use context. Some people use the context hook, right? So you have to figure out how to do that and keep up with it. Vue.js, completely separate framework. Some of the best parts of Angular, some part of the best parts of React, put in this new framework. Vue 2 and 3 had some consternation from developers. It's a wonderful, wonderful fix of a lot of things and movement forward, but people get frustrated because they're like, I'm just trying to be a Vue developer. I don't want to know React Angular and like it's so different, right? So the versions are different. They have their own state management system based off of Redux called Vuex. So it has the very similar concept but they handle mutations differently. They actually call them mutations and you commit them instead of doing this action creator stuff. Okay, <laughs> are you following? And then Angular, which is, you don't have to learn Angular. You don't have to learn anything else. Well, yeah, but they have their own state management with NGRX. So Angular is cool in that they have the OOP part for the components. They have the reactive and immutability and functional programming part for the data. But you can still use NGRX from a state management perspective. And there's a variety of other ways to enhance Angular from this stuff. So this, this is just a tip of the iceberg. I, I'm not going to even get started on this felt where the early days of its router versus it's kind of like web components, but not really, and lit HTML, which isn't even included in here. It's just a lot to ask of a front-end developer to keep up to date and recognize, are you able of building a website or not? It's like, I, I think so. I mean, how does this not cause insecurity? <laughs> it, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely nuts. So very fatigued, very stressful, right? And this detracts from overall happiness of being a front-end developer. So how do we fix all this? We fix it with Elm. Elm can fix a lot of this. We can breathe a sigh of release just looking at this slide and feeling very calm. First, no runtime exception. So all the errors that you ever get, all the things you're worried about 
I try to get a null pointer. I try to call a promise. I did. I forgot to try catch. My data is all out of whack. Don't worry about it. There's no runtime exceptions. You'll never get them. So all those problems go away. So let me say it to say the same thing, but say it another way. There's no one to find is not a function. <laughs> like that, that error you see in JavaScript will never happen. And that that alone should just make you feel really, really good. There's no side effects. Now, this one took me about two years to really wrap my head around just because I was still learning the differences between separating side effects and code because I constantly done side effects. As a front-end developer, that's all you do is create side effects. It's how we do interesting things. And the front-end is rife with side effects, way more than the back-end because we're moving things, we're changing the screen, we're making HP calls at the same time as we're doing animations. That's the world we live in. And separating the two is very strange until you get into testing and you realize that pure functions make it simple. And then you're like, interesting, how can I separate the two and organize my code around this? It's a very interesting concept. Elm just bypasses all that drama. They don't have side effects. So suddenly every function is pure. You don't have to favor pure functions because every function in Elm is pure. So suddenly every function is a pure function, which means you don't have to worry about creating mocks ever because there's no need. Things just got a lot cooler. Really awesome. And then lastly, one architecture. So all that framework fatigue has been the same since Elm came out. There's been some minor API changes, but for the most part, it's all the same thing. Same four things that you have to memorize. So that architecture, you don't need to get extra libraries on top of it, like NGRX or different ways of getting a React boilerplate so you don't have to write all the Redux stuff. Like, there's no point. The architecture's there, it works, and you just use it. So let's dive into these and show you how they are really promises that make you feel that much better. So when we talk about a strictly type functional language like Elm, it's all based on function. And when we talk about functions that are pure, we're talking about an input that goes into the function and has an output. And they're just functions. Now Elm is based really on functions and types, but what we're really concerned about of making an app is functions. So if you think of like Go, for example, Golang, or you know other languages that don't have classes, like that's how you do it. You just build functions. And in Elm, it's all about the ones that don't have any side effects. So we have an input, an output, and that's it. See that little box, how there's like no effect from the outside? So an example would be, we're going to take a, an Elm function here. And it's called hello, so that's the name. And you notice that there's no function keyword, there's no const or var or let to define it. It's literally just the name, that's the function. And it has a parameter, and that parameter's to the right. So we use spaces to define the function name and then everything to write the parameter. When you're done, you put an equal sign. And so that's how you define a function, the name and then the parameters. Just use white space to designate the difference. And usually your code editor will indicate the first thing is the function name and then everything else is a parameter name after that. Whatever you put after the equals is the function body. So very similar to a error function in JavaScript. Whatever that expression you do down there will do it. And one thing to note here about this hey, Notice that there's no return keyword. It's very similar to an arrow function, a fat arrow function in JavaScript, where it just automatically returns because every function has an input and an output, which means every function always returns an output, which means why would you put a return keyword if they always return something? So it makes it easier, a lot less to write. So in this case, we have hey, we're adding it to name. We're using plus plus because plus plus is for strings and lists. And so that, that invocation, that call in it, is the same way. You just have the function space and then you give the parameter, and that's how you invoke it. So very similar, no need for parentheses or any of that jazz. Now in JavaScript, those kind of guarantees aren't there. So when we talk about pure functions and guarantees and, and guarantee something works, you have to guarantee that certain fundamental properties work every time. And that means that if you give a certain input, it'll always have the same output. So we've talked about pure functions where you have like same input, same output, no side effects. But that same input, same output is a guarantee. Guarantee means it always works. It means it's dependable. It means you can build an app out of all functions that are guaranteed to work and suddenly your app works. That's kind of the fundamentals here. To see what it does when it doesn't work, look at JavaScript. See that let name right there? That name is a string that we set, but it's a variable. It means its value can vary, right? So if we call get name, it's going to return something, the string something. But we can change it later with that set below, that set name, which means that if you call it a get name at some later point, it wouldn't. So this variable is kind of state inside of a module that could possibly change, and it's a side effect that affects that function's output 
it doesn't matter that you know it says just return name in there. It's referencing that variable in that closure up above. It could change. And so whether this is in a class or a module, those are the kind of things that break the guarantees that we don't. So let's talk about an example. How does that work? It seems obvious, but people use math because it's the simplest to, to wrap your head around. So we have an add function, and it takes an A and a B. And notice that there's no other outside state. There's no let name, no nothing. It takes only the inputs, and it works on those inputs. So A plus B is the math version. I'm using the plus. And it's going to operate on that A plus B. And that means every time we call it with the same inputs of 2, 3, we're always going to get 5. Now, if you had an outside variable in like JavaScript, you could change add 2, 3 could sometimes return 6. But you can't do that in Elm. You're not allowed to use outside state. It doesn't exist. And so there's no way to break a function like that. It's always going to be guaranteed to work. It's very predictable. And that, mean, that means in turn your code's predictable. You start making all these functions together together of other functions, and then your application is predictable. So that's where the value comes from. So when we talk about expressive, that's, I, Jeremy used that word a lot, and I think it's more of just understanding the types, but more so that it just requires very little code. One of the draws from a lot of the Java refugees who went to Ruby, and then in turn the Ruby developers who went to Elixir for more predictability around their code, was that it required less code to do more. And so that's what a lot of the Ruby developers liked originally was their CRUD apps were very, very small. And they had some functional stuff like list comprehension, map, filter, reduce. And they could do a lot with very little code compared to what they would used to do before things like Spring Boot and others came around. And so Elm's the same way in terms of comparing itself to JavaScript where we have a list here. Think of it like an array that you can only read from, right? You're not going to read from a particular value. You're just going to add and, and slice things up. So it's a list of strings. And our function's also another type we can do. So we have a list, we have functions. We also can compose these things together. And so if you look at this Greek people here, it takes a list. So that it's going to take whatever list we want to put in it. And that list can map on that hello function. And so that hello function is going to say, every time you go to item one, call the hello function on it, whatever the output is, put it in a brand new list at that exact position. And so that's how map works. Think of it like a rate map, list map is about the same thing. And then we can call that greet people function with the names list. And it'll take Jesse, Alice, and Bellick and replace it with, hey, Jesse, hey, Alice, and hey, Bellick. And so that's how you can compose these types and variables together to kind of compose programs. When people talk about how do you build functional programs if you're not doing object-oriented, how does that work? Very similar to Go. You just take a bunch of functions, put them together, and Elm is the same thing. You're composing these things together. And because of a function of Elm being based on an ML-based language, Lambda Calculus, basically, every function takes one input, which means that if you have more than one parameter, it means that it's curried, right? You, you, you call it, and it's a partial application. And so you can completely rewrite the function to just be list map hello. You don't even need to pass the parameter in because list map is waiting for two parameters. So it's waiting for you to give it a list. So it's another way to shrink the code, too. Now, you can do this in JavaScript. You can do this in Python. The challenge with JavaScript without something like TypeScript and variadic tuples is you don't know that that function's waiting for another thing. And the runtime errors for it are awful. And the compilation errors in TypeScript don't really, aren't very functional friendly. Where in Elm, this is a very common thing. So in add, if I call it with an A and a B, it's an A plus B, that's the function. And I call it with one plus one, one plus two, it gives you three. Fantastic. But what if we call add with one? Just that. That actually gives you a function back that's waiting for a single input of a number. When you give it that number, it's going to add one to it. And so this is a way you can create these reusable functions, for example. Right? So if I just call add with one. So we can actually store that in a variable called increment. And that increment is going to be a function. And it's only looking for one parameter, not two, because we already gave it one, add one. So if you call increment with two, it's going to add one to it, three. If you call increment with 41, it's going to be 42. Now, composing like this is so common that it starts to get really gross if you don't have functional capabilities to compose these things together. Let me give you an example of a simple program where we're trying to say, take this greeting and wrap it with around stuff. So we have hello name. It says hey plus the name, whatever name you pass in that function. Then we have a second one called talk like me, where every phrase is constantly awesome and exposed and explanation, right? Exclaimed. So it's going to add an explanation point at the end of it. And when you take the uppercase of my name, because you're exclaiming, because I'm Jesse Warden and everything's loud, you're going to make it the uppercase, then you're going to call hello on it, 
then you're going to wrap that with talk this talk like Jesse, where you have the explanation point. In. So mushing them together like this parentheses is, is because you're, you know, putting them all together and composing them together. But it's very quick. You could tell the JavaScript language, Python, things like that. They're not made for this composing of functions. It's not a normal way of doing things, right? They're used to abstracting away into a single method, all this kind of stuff, or setting that to a variable, then calling it. So you don't have to do this mushing. And the other problem with this is that you actually read it from right to left. Most code we read from left to right, if you're American. And this is the complete opposite of that, even though we try to create them in order, top to bottom. And so it just doesn't work for those two reasons. So what they do is they use pipes. And what it allows you to do is compose these functions from top to bottom, you can read left to right. And so if we were to walk through this, the first input is Jesse. So that pipe's gonna take it and give it to the first parameter of the next function. So if I say run it, it's going to say, Jesse, okay, go to the string upper. String upper takes one parameter of string and returns an uppercase version of that string. The pipe's going to say, okay, I'm going to take the output of this function and give it as the first to the next function, which is hello. So it's going to take that uppercase Jesse, put it in hello, which will say, hey, Jesse. The output of that function, hey, Jesse, as a string, it's going to take out and give it to the next function as the first parameter, talk like Jesse. And once it's done, the total output is hello, Jesse. Right, and that's that's how pipes work, and so that's how you would normally compose functions together. Sometimes you can abstract that whole block in another function, so it's a really simple one-line function. But underneath, it's all abstracted, very similar to what you do in object-oriented programming or imperative, where you're abstracting things away in functions that are you know sm small, nice and usable. But underneath, they do a lot of work. Now JavaScript's trying to catch up with this technique, and it it's brought a lot of insight into the community of how much people think it's just a lot of the nuances around it. One thing I found interesting is at the time of this presentation, it's made it to stage two. So it's enough where people are definitely interested in it and are interested in moving forward, but the API is a mess. No one can agree on the implementation details. And there's two important nuances of why I sometimes agree with the hack style people in F-sharp. If you're not familiar, the hack style basically says, you can use pipe, but there's no of this curried function or partial function nonsense. We have a placeholder of where the parameter goes from each function. So Jesse's gonna jump to that little triangle thing right there, that little up arrow, the symbol could change, right? Obviously it's only stage two. So Jesse's gonna jump there, you're gonna call uppercase on it, and then the next function, it's gonna go inside the first parameter of hello, and same with this one, whatever this outputs to there. So it's very clear. There's none of this like mental model of like curried functions. And are you using data first versus data last? Like all that goes away. There's no, none of that. It's just, we're gonna use pipe, but we're gonna have a placeholder. The problem I have with the hack people is that this, this style is actually validated in Rescript. Rescript, depending upon you ask, are not generally fans of curried functions for performance reasons, but it's built into the language because it's based on a camel and things like that. But they have a very similar placeholder called an underscore. And it works really well because they're more of a data first language. Most people in JavaScript don't know what data last is. So they put the most important data first and the things they don't care about at the end kind of default. And that works out really well when you have a placeholder because you can put that wherever you want. You don't care about current functions. And it's very clear in the pipeline where the data is going, right? And where, who's calling what. And so suddenly you negate the need for these current functions and creating this crazy stuff that you don't have types for. In Rescript you do, but again, based on our camera, you don't see them. So I think the hack style is kind of validated. This is a really good use case for people who are just not fans of curry and, uh, and JavaScript's not typed. So if you call a function that's curried and you're expecting it to only take one parameter, but it actually takes two and it gives you a curried function, the runtime errors are very strange. You'll say like, you're trying to add one to a function. You're like, oh, I meant to call the function with another parameter, then add the result of that, my bad. But you don't see that in the runtime exceptions. They're awful for functional programmers. So the hack style is trying to compensate for that. The problem I have with the hack style is that it's not going to be used by functional programmers. <laughs> like the people who would use this aren't really interested in functional programming anyway, so they're probably never going to use pipe. And so the justification for getting rid of all this nonsense is that it's not nonsense to those who do functional programming. It's a very common, normal way we've been doing things for the past, you know, umpteen years. So I think the hack people have a great idea on this. That's I think that's fantastic, the placeholder. I think it's completely irrelevant in the F-sharp syntax. The F-sharp style uses what we've been used to, and that is you just put functions in there. But if you want, you could put a, uh, an arrow function, and it would automatically place it in there. So you could do an inline function, and there's no need for a placeholder. You don't need it. You just do curried functions like we've been doing, or just put a function that you define on the fly.
And so they both have their merits and pros and cons. Obviously, I'm a big fan of the F sharp, but I think it's interesting that you know this is uh, yet another thing we've borrowed from functional programming, put in a regular language. And Elm is like, cool, I have this and I work. But if you guys want to debate, that's cool, <laughs> right? It's just a problem we don't have. Also, another interesting thing is that because I I go back and forth between using the pipeline syntax and JavaScript with Babel, for example, but then go back to Elm and other languages, you can use a Firacod font, and it'll make these two letter symbols readable. So for example, the fat arrow is the pipe and then the greater than symbol. The fat arrow is the equal sign and the greater than symbol. So there's a lot of these symbols that we do in JavaScript where they're two characters. Doing them with fear code, it'll automatically make them a nice little shape. And so it makes your code a little bit more readable. And if you do like the not equals equals equals, it actually makes that readable. It looks like one symbol. So it's just a nice font to deal with both regular programming and functional coding, stuff like that. So when we talk about no runtime exceptions, how does Elm achieve that? How do we not have any possible errors? Most of them are from lack of types. If you use TypeScript, you're already aware of how many problems go away simply by using types. If you're willing to invest the effort to guarantee that the code you write in TypeScript is good, your errors go away. Now, when somebody consumes your TypeScript code in JavaScript, the problems manifest again. If they get in your code, you're good, but unless you sanitize those inputs as typed coming from JavaScript, you're back to where you started. Elm doesn't allow you to do that. Everything is typed. And so, for example, they have the basic types of int, which is different than a float or decimal. So an integer, it's very clear that age is 42, and it, Elm knows that that's the type of it. And so you designate that. Now, you'll, you'll see we're putting the types on top of these things. Before, you didn't have to. And that's because Elm can infer this stuff, just like TypeScript. It kind of knows what you mean. If you're using a plus versus a plus plus, it kind of knows what you're trying to accomplish, right? And as the functions get put together, it's also smart enough to infer. But it's still a best practice, and there's some edge cases where you have to type. So it's generally a good practice to do it. Others would argue that it detracts from readability. I, I don't think so. And I'll explain why when we start seeing the functions on top. So hello is a string here. It's double quotes, not single quotes. That would be a character. Is true is a bool, so we have booleans where you can clearly define true or false, and it's just like Python where it's a capital T true and a capital F false. And numbers, all lists or arrays are a type, single type homogeneous list. So you'd have a list of integers. You couldn't put a string in it, for example. If you wanted a list of strings, you'd say list string or array string, right? You wouldn't say a mix. If you want to mix, use something like a tuple. It allows you to kind of mix and match data types or records. That works too. So in our function before, if we were to type it, what it really is, is a function that takes in a string and returns a string. So if you look at the name, we put that type on the top of functions. So TypeScript, Rescript, and some of the other languages, like Java, you put them in line the function. You say like the function, this parameter is this, and this parameter is this type, and the return value is this. A lot of the ML-based languages, you put that kind of definition at the top because we don't care really what goes on in the function or even the definition. All we really care about is this is the input and this is the output. So you kind of put that up top, right? And it's not, because again, it's optional. You can write your function without this stuff. And Rescript and TypeScript, they make it optional too, but sometimes you then, if it's not, you have to go into the function to do it. So you can actually keep the type separate. It's just a, a way it works. An add would be different. Add is an, a function that takes an integer and another integer and returns an integer. Now, that's not technically correct. What it really says, if you look at the two arrows, not one, it's a function that takes an integer and returns a function that's looking for an integer and will return an integer. So this goes back to the curried functions or all functions take one input, even though it looks like it has two. And that's why we see two arrows instead of one. So just something weird to keep in the back of your mind if you're not familiar with it. Now, compile errors are probably the number one coolest thing about Elm. And most people look at their compilers, especially TypeScript, if they've got a really convoluted typed code base that either has a lot of any's or some really complicated types, sometimes they'll have the attitude of, I want my compiler just to shut up and compile. I will do whatever it takes to make it be quiet. Elm is the opposite. Elm is used as a tool to refactor. Now, normally that's the realm of TDD. But Elm, these kind of compiler errors here are best in class in terms of clearness, in terms of reading what is actually the problem, and then trying to give you recommendations on probably what you should do about it. Both from a, I'm an Elm programmer or I'm from JavaScript, but what is going on? I'm so lost. So let me break this one down, for example. If we call that hello function, instead of with a name, a string, we call it with 42, it's going to say the first argument to the function. 
So you can, although all functions take one input, Elm's like, nah, look, we know add takes two inputs, okay, A and B. Hello, it takes one. So the first input is a 42, and it underlines it with that red. So you know what it's talking about. Like, we don't like this thing right here. It's very clear what it's talking about. You don't have to search through your code, match up a variable name that it says with is what you wrote. Like, it's very clear what it is. Now, it's angry about the types. It's saying, you gave me a number, or at least what I think you think you gave me is a number, but I need the first thing to be a string. The first argument needs to be a string. So it's kind of clear that it's saying, hello, needs 42 to actually be quotes 42. Now, maybe you did it on purpose. A lot of times in Elm, it's very common to put numbers in the front end stuff, but all front end stuff like text fields and inputs, they're all strings. So it's very common to convert it from an integer to a string. And so that's why they, they, they say this is probably the most likely reason you're doing this. This probably was intentional by you. You actually meant to do this, but the function doesn't allow that. So you need to convert it first and that's okay. And so this is a very common thing. These, these compiler errors are referenced as kind of the pinnacle or gold standard of how you should make compiler errors for a language. So let's talk about records because records are probably what most JavaScript developers are used to from, if they've never done TypeScript or Rescript, they've created objects. But these objects are typed in Elm. And so we, we don't have to create anything. We can just create an object on the fly and type it. So in the case of dog, we're going to say dog colon, that's the type definition. A name is of type string and an age is type int. So if you're ever doing domain driven design, it allows you to do the, what's considered an and. So usually you're looking for types that are an or or an and when you're doing those kind of types, advanced types. A dog, a record would be the and where you can have two pieces of data exist for one thing because a dog can have a name and an age as a single data type. Make sense? And so this, uh, this safe, consistent thing of records allows you to say, all right, now that I've defined it, I can create a new one saying dog equals and actually create the object on the fly. And as long as the types match, you're good because you've defined what the dog is, right? And so you've defined it on top. And you can access it via dot safely. So you don't have to do the nullus coalescing. Like once you define it like this, you're safe. If not, the compiler will let you know. If you misspell name, the compiler will let you know. If, if the type doesn't look right, the compiler will tell you why the type doesn't. So these are the values of those. If you're from an object-oriented programming background, you're probably wondering, all right, how do I create multiple of these things? I want to go dog, equal, dog, equal, dog, equal. Like, how do I create new things? Well, if you define a type alias, that is how you define a record that you can create many instances of. And so that keyword alias, you could type alias, think of it like class or a data class in Python, for example. We're going to create instances of these things that are pure data. And that's how it works in Elm. You just, as long as you define these types, you can now create many different dogs with many different instances of different data amongst them. They're based on the same template, but the compiler will guarantee that all of these instances are type safe. So it has a name of a string, has an age of an int, but it has a new property called a breed. A breed is where we do the or. A breed can only be one of three possibilities. It's only a Sheltie or a lab or a retriever. So we talked about and and or. This is the or. If you can have a bunch of possibilities of a data type, but only one, this is, this is the type. So the only difference is it doesn't have an alias. It's basically a type and it's only one of the, one of the above. You can, only, you can only pick one Sheltie lab or retriever. You can't be both. It's impossible. It, we can use that breed and that Sheltie and it's very clear that that's an instance of that and that breed is just that one breed. So that's how you do it with types. That gets rid of 90% of your other problems. The null pointers are not just because of types. Null pointers are because of the lack of data, not just because of the wrong data. Now, Tony Hoare was the guy who invented these things back in Algo, and they kind of took off from there, but he was credited as kind of the creator of null. And he's got this weird, awesome feeling of responsibility of handling the fact that he caused the null chaos throughout the world, right? He calls it his billion dollar mistake. And in the presentation that I linked to, if you're interested in watching it, the guy's, he's really humble. He's a great guy. He talks about how it's probably in the trillions. <laughs> it's way higher. And I think all of us would agree it's, it's, it's beyond the trillions at this point. The amount of programs that crash, windows, blue screens of death, all these weird different faults in hardware and software has probably cost the world ungodly amounts of money. And so that's why he calls it the billion dollar mistake is the null pointer. What I didn't realize is that Elm fixes this. And it's not just Elm, there's other languages, but this, this problem it doesn't happen anymore. It's gone. You don't have to deal with it. And so suddenly you don't have to worry about the null mistake. It's been fixed. The way it's fixed is by using a type of maybe.
instead of saying, well, it could be undefined and we'll just deal with it later, or in Python, we see it, we freak out, we throw exceptions. Elm can't throw exceptions, but what it can do is type things extremely well. So now we're going to type the lack of data because there's only two possibilities. Either we have some data in whatever type it is, or we don't. It's nothing. Which means that any piece of code that possibly might not have data, you have to type. Which also means you can no longer ignore undefined. If you get it, your code has to handle it. And if you miss a spot, you don't have to worry about it. The compiler has your back. And that's amazing. So a lot of people think, oh no, it's a maybe. I have to deal with all this stuff. But now, it's very clear in every single part of your code where the data is not going to be there maybe. It's a possibility. And the compiler will guarantee that all those possibilities are covered, which means you will never get null pointer exceptions, which is amazing. So that's handled for you. So let, let me get an example in JavaScript because this, I think, is is hard to wrap your head around of the concept of nothing. But we're if you're a JavaScript developer, you're very familiar with this. So when we get a first item from an array, we get a list. Okay, we call I call them list and Elm, but there's arrays too. They're two different data types, but they're about the same thing. They have order listed data, right? When you get the first item in the array. Can you guarantee it's there? No, I mean, it's dynamic language. You can't guarantee. Now you can write shields around it to guarantee there's always a piece of data, but at the end of the day, somebody, when they go to the first item index of the array, they can't guarantee there's data there. It might not be there, it might not. Like you can't guarantee that. So if I call with an empty array, it's gonna be undefined. It means nothing, there's nothing there. It's an empty array. But if I do put something there, it gives me the value. So that's the concept of maybe it's there, Maybe it's not. Like, I can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee there's ever a bunch of items in your array unless I put all this code in your array and never let anybody get it. And that's what a lot of object oriented programming around collections is about is that, you know, sequestering access to that data to guarantee these things ever happen. But it still doesn't always work, hence null pointers. Now, in Elm, you can get around that. So let's talk about this. We have an array, but notice the type definition is maybe int. Maybe there's an item there, maybe there's not. If there is, it's an array full of integers, we're good. But if it's not, it's nothing, okay? So it's a maybe int in this array. If we get a first item in the array, it's gonna be nothing, because we gave it an empty array. But if we give it an uh, array with one item in it, it's gonna give us just one. And so that's cool about the same thing, one's nothing instead of undefined. The difference is it's a type and the compiler will guarantee you handle it. Now there's multiple ways to handle it. You can do ifs and statements, but my favorite is the case expression. Case expressions are dealing with the or things. So when we talk about types, they deal with the or things. And the reason the ors are cool is because they're only a set amount. So remember how we saw breeds, there's only three? Well, in maybes, there's only two. It's either the data is there or it's not. And that allows you in a case expression to designate what how you deal with it. So think of it like a switch statement that has your back. If you ever use TypeScript with the strict compiler option enabled, it guarantees that you get every single possible case statement, right? And you, you don't forget one, including default. Elm's kind of the same with the case expression. Whatever the value that comes out of this, which is gonna be either the, the just with an integer or nothing, if it comes out with the just item, cool. We can get the item, we can access it and return a value from this particular function. First item is, in this case, a one. And we use string from int to convert it. Fantastic. But if we get something from an empty array, it's going to be a nothing. And so we can handle that scenario and say nothing is an array. Now, remember when I talked about the compiler guarantees that you handle nothing? Case expressions are a perfect example of that. If I just do the just and I don't do the nothing, the compiler is going to be like, yo, dog, uh, you're missing nothing. You need to handle this. So I'm not going to compile until you handle the null pointer scenario. Once you do this, null pointer is gone. It's like, that's that's it? So all I have to do is make sure uh, I found no data. I return an empty string. Like You can totally do that. You can put strange values in your UI, your front end, like, hello, I don't know your name, right? And that's that's okay, because it'll compile, right? So no longer have those, those possibilities. Now, I understand that a lot of times for a front end developer, not a back end developer, front end developer, you might not have what you're supposed to show here. Usually it's very difficult to explain to a designer error screens for two reasons. One, users don't care about error screens. They're, they're just like, can I do my job or not? Second, designers typically don't like it because developers get all nuanced about all the possibilities that go wrong. And the designer's like, yeah, I know, but what can we do about it? Can they sit there? Can they retry? Like, you gotta help me help you. 
tell me the visual designer what I can possibly do to show the user that they could remedy the situation. You always have that challenge. Now with Elm, you have every single possible nuance of when data is not there, maybe from a backend or from the user entering it. And so you can explain to the designer what to do. So that equips you in a very good way to help the visual designer explain those situations where data could be missing and the user could help fix it. Or the backend developer could recognize that scenario is there and you have two options there. You could either make the types guarantee you don't have missing data and never allow it to be a maybe, or you find a way to tell the user like, oh, you might have entered bad data and we don't, we just don't have it right now. You entered a first name, but not your last name. It's not there, right? And that, that could be valid. That could be something the visual designer could build. If you don't know that, the designer's busy, <laughs> they have a debug to do. So you can put it in there and say, look, whenever the designer tells me what to do here, I can do this, but the code won't go to production. So it'll compile for you to test, but it'll guarantee you have no, no pointer exceptions because you can't go to prod without that, that debug to do in your code. All right, so that gets rid of no pointer exceptions. I think talking about the no side effects really des deserves its own section because it's just the most amazing thing. And there's only one trade-off for this, which I'll get to. The amazing thing is that suddenly every single function is pure, which means that you no longer need mocks for any of your testing. Now, there are, is a, a section maybe of Elm affectionados who believe that you don't even need tests because the compiler is that good. And there's a lot of merit to what they say. That's true. But that doesn't designate correctness. Remember what I talked about? Like, hello, I don't know your name. Why did we allow that to happen in a UI? Unit tests should have found that. Yes, the maybe guaranteed that it never says undefined, but we had to put something for nothing. We didn't know what to put when the user doesn't have their first name written in the record we got back from the server. So we put, I don't know your first name. Ha, ha, ha. We did that because we knew the designer and the product owner would see that, get angry, and that would force them to provide us a UI for it or go yell at the backend developer to fix their data, right? You could also put a unit test around that to make sure that it never happens, <laughs> right? So those kind of things are where the tests are very, very important. And if you're going to write tests, you're going to run into situations where you're doing side effects, and it's frustrating. But Elm doesn't have them, so you don't have to. That's amazing, which means you're more likely to write really good tests focusing on correctness. None of this nonsense around, is it not null? Like, that's amazing. So use Elm test. It's really cool for that. So if you never understood like I did, what does it mean to separate side effects from code? It, it, this should hopefully help because this is something we commonly do in JavaScript a lot is that we make fetch calls all over the place. Node fetch, Axios, request, whatever library of choice, whatever mechanism you do it, front end and back end. It's all about making HTTP calls. And in this case, if we call the get users function with no parameters, it's going to return a promise. And at some point, that promise, you're probably going to do a response that okay. If so, call response, return response.json, which is another promise, gives a JSON out or text if it's an error or XML, whatever, binary. And so that's going to return. When we call this get users function, that's going to return a promise. And that function is immediately going to go do that side effect. It's going to open an HTTP socket, do a bunch of stuff, maybe throw an exception. And if it's in that promise, you, hopefully you have the catch handled and you do something with it instead of let that exception bubble up, right? Elm, we do the exact same thing where we have a function that takes no parameters and we do an HTTP get call, right? And we expect whatever comes back. We send some message. When you call that function of get users and the HTTP get, all it's going to do is create data. It's going to return data and that's it. So like, it's not going to go do the HTTP call. It's not going to immediately open a socket connection. It's going to say, okay, Here's the HP get call data that I will do. And that's it. <laughs> so like your unit tests for this are kind of like weird, right? So let's talk about how we would test the JavaScript portion of this. Fetch mock's probably the easiest. There's ways of doing this in Jest and Mocha 2 and Sheenon, but let's use fetch mock just because I think it's the easiest to grok. So before we test this code, we have to set up some mock and say, look, when you call this server, we're gonna get an array of users back. They're strings, okay? And whatever any code anywhere hits this exact URL, I want you to send this array back with user one, user two. And the reason we wrote it like that, it's very easy to assert on this really simple data, okay? So then we write the unit test and we say, all right, call await get users. When the users come back, let's assert that first item is user one because get users should be under the hood calling the server and parsing and handling errors and blah, 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 abstracting all the stuff we don't care about. Just give me the users or not. 
And if it works in a happy pass scenario, when we call server and it gives data back, it should work, right? Cool. Then we have to reset the state. Now that's probably the simplest mock you'll ever see. Most mocks get way more complicated than this. And this, that's how it works. Sometimes you get users who actually take the fetch in it if you're trying to do functional side effects or you know, designate your dependencies from outside. Or maybe you have the actual fetch module completely abstracted away to your own custom one that deals with your API and its custom errors. And so you inject that dependency in, which means you didn't have to stub or mock it up top. A lot of work, right? So that goes away. In Elm, you say, okay, I call uh, get users, I get a result there. And what do I expect it to be? The URL? Like, it's just data. <laughs> it's just a record or an object. So like, what's the point of this test? Let me get that for you. There is none. <laughs> like, it's, it's kind of like when people learned uh, action creators and Redux for the first time, they're like, dude, this is really easy to unit test. It's so easy, it's stupid. Maybe we shouldn't even do it. Like that feeling you're getting, that, that spotty sense, the tingling, like this can't be this easy. It's because it is, and it's pointless. You don't need to do it. There's no side effect. So the, like, you don't have to worry about this not working. Now, yes, there are cases where you're parameterizing it, such as maybe putting an ID in the URL and you want to make sure that works and the shape of the URL looks right. That's good. That would be a good unit test. But in this case, when you're calling HTTP, I, the point is there's no side effects, so there's no need to set up mocks. That's what I'm trying to get across here. And you can see it's kind of pointless. Like, there's no side effects, so the unit test is super easy to unit test. By the way, if you're not familiar, that's Elm test syntax. It's one of the Elm collaboration repo is very, very cool. It has fuzz testing built in. Super awesome. Property testing, you're not aware. So in JavaScript, what do we do for the response that okay, right? The response that okay, this is one of the problems I have with fetch being a low level API. It's not a problem, it's a good thing. But it's, unfortunately, the community hasn't built enough t stuff on top of this because this is always API dependent. Just because your API sends a 500 doesn't mean we should throw an error, right? There could be reasons why and those HTTP status code could mean things and you could try different things. So that's fine, but what do we, what do we do here? <laughs> like, like, isn't this known by this point that you know there's JSON parsing errors and we should respond to this? Like, it, this is such a common thing in the the backend Node API world and the frontend browser world. Like, a lot of these things should be common. So, what do we do here? How do we respond? Do we have to customize this for every API we ever write? It's ridiculous, right? Yes, it is ridiculous. In Elm, they've already handled the five common things that always happen in every UI in the backend app, but I, Elm's only for UI, but you know what I'm saying. And here's the cool thing about it, is that these types, we only have to care about the last one. <laughs> what that means is that bad URL, if you type a URL in, it's not your fault. Whoever did the config of the URL, or you copy pasted it, maybe that's your fault, but the server-side gate, server-side developer gave it to you, so technically it's their fault, cool. This is, again, one of the benefits of being a front-end developer is like 99% of the problems are all back-end developers, and you have now a compiler to tell you with types that it's proven correctly, not your fault. It should make you feel really good. So bad URLs, not your fault. Now, maybe you dynamically put stuff in a config file reading to Elm. That's your fault for doing config stuff, but whatever. But bottom line is you typed HT colon instead of like HTTPS or HTTP, for example, right? Timeout. Again, not your problem. The internet went down. You can't control that now. <laughs> like, like it's not my fault Comcast blew up. Like, there's no compiler error for that. There's no runtime exception for that in ADA, right? So it's not your fault. Timeout error, maybe the server took too long. Who knows? But it took too long. You have a time limit and it didn't work. Network error, also not your fault. Internet went down again, things like that, not your problem. Bad status, the server sent you something that wasn't a 200 or 300. Not your fault. That's the API server or the browser being whack, right? Sometimes Chrome and Firefox do some strange things, irrespective of cores and send back some status. Again, not your fault. The only thing you care about is bad body. And that just means the JSON, text, XML, binary, whatever you're parsing back from the API, your parsing said, this is not good. It's not acceptable. We don't like it. And that's cool. It's black or white. It, most of the parsing libraries in Elm will tell you, for the most part, where it's not looking like it's supposed to. And it's very clear this is not the happy path, and here's why. Cool. So you handle it. You got a nice little, like, or type that you can case against, handle all five, and say, bad URL, not my fault. Timeout, not my fault. Network status, not my fault. Bad status, not my fault. Bad body, my fault. I'll fix it. Oh, wait, you changed the schema? Not my fault. <laughs> it's the server side developer again. So Elm is awesome like that, by having that type error for us for HTTP calls.
Now, when you're testing ACP stuff, that means you can focus on the things that matter, and that's the bad body. And really what you're interested in is your parser. Can the server-side developer change the JSON enough, assuming they don't use schemas, to break your stuff? You know, what's, what's the leeway there? And so we're going to take a known fixture and just test the happy path. Say if we take our decoder, right, this is the thing that parses our JSON. If we give it a known fixture, whatever JSON we know the server-side sends back, and it should be parsable. This is a good example of getting users from a server. We convert that result of could fail or not to a maybe, and then we default to a bad user. So we want the test to fail if we couldn't parse it. We're going to snag off the first name and say, all right, if I have a good user, what should be the Elm record equivalent of what this JSON would parse to? Do they equal? If they do, you're good. And this should pass 99% of the time until the server side developer is like, hey, I got a different schema. I want to change it. There's some tools I've seen on Twitter where you can real time call APIs over and over. And when the JSON changes, you can do a diff, take that diff, save it to a file, and rerun your test suite. So some advanced stuff. But this is what you're interested in, right? Because the server side guy, this is their attack vector <laughs> to break your stuff. But that's okay. You're writing tests as a front-end developer because you know you got to help back-end developers who never test their stuff and have technical debt. It's never your fault. And that's cool. You've already got enough work. I understand. But Elm will help you. Now you have more free time to help the back-end people. Cool. Now, fuzz testing is also important because when you have typed languages, you'll you'll see the joke of Haskell developers. will see like the, our hello function where it took a string, returned a string. They go, why is this untyped? That's because string is too wide. You want to narrow your types, right? There's a good article I'll, I'll try to put in the comments about narrowing your types. And fuzz tests will try every possible permutation of that. So you write one unit test and they'll generate like a 100 or 1,000 unit test of different inputs and test that same function. So strings and numbers are notorious where you try infinite numbers of numbers like negative one, uh, math.py, <laughs> infinity, infinity, really large numbers. And like your code doesn't work. Right. It's, it says it works with ints, but it's like, oh, I was expecting only positive numbers. My bad. Right. And fuzz test will find that. It'll you write one unit test, but it runs it with a hundred different random inputs. And so in this case, we're interested of generating some bad JSON that should probably cause the decoder to fail. Like this should this should be intentionally looking weird. And it'll run through our user decoder. In this case, we're expecting the unhappy path to always fail. It should catch some bad inputs. That's good. Because again, this stuff's going right to the UI. So you want to make sure that we catch the bad stuff, right? All right. So that gives you the understanding of how we get rid of null pointers, how we get it, and side effects just make your testing so much better. What's the downside? Race conditions. <laughs> I'm not going to cover that in video because it's hard. So let's talk about the LM architecture. This whole thing is why you don't have to worry about framework fatigue anymore. Because once you learn this, you kind of get an appreciation for what Redux could have been, but it's not its fault. It's JavaScript, right? It just doesn't have certain facilities that Elm has. And second, you only do it once. <laughs> like you don't, you don't have to. Oh well, yeah, that's how we did Elm two years ago. But now everyone does blah with this library. Like, dude, like there's maybe maybe a subtle argument with like HTML.map versus not and hiding side effects in, but dude, everyone uses the same ar Elm architecture, right? It, it all works for the same app. So we're going to talk about this whole model view message update architecture because this is how all Elm stuff works. So let's talk about the model first because most of us in UI like doing the view first, the front end, and that's the most fun. That's what we get jazzed about. We're pumped. We can't wait to see things in the screen. Even in a type language with Elm, it's got a really fast compile loop. It's a fast feedback loop so you can see stuff. And we just, well, we can't wait to take that you know, Figma comp or that sketch comp or that Photoshop comp or whatever and just put it in HTML. And CSS, and that's not what you should do, say the experts. I understand what they're talking about, but sometimes I need my dopamine fix, I need my happiness. But when I'm mature and an adult, I start with a model. Why do you start with a model? The reason you start with a model is because everything in Elm can be typed. And sometimes you can make impossible situations impossible by typing them. But more importantly, it allows you to understand your domain and practice domain driven design. You're using language that the business and users use, and you can talk to everybody and you type it and you get that set up. Then you can build a wrap, an app around those types. And that's what you're supposed to do. And as you learn, you change those types and the Elm compiler has your back. So you have fearless refactoring. That's why you start with models. So this one should look familiar if you know Redux. It's basically just your initial model. What is your initial record, the default in the reducer? And in this case, we have a count. So we're going to build an app that increments the number up and down. 
And if you want to go to leapp.com, that's how the basic app works. This would be the, the Redux equivalent of that, right? It's just an object with a count property of zero that starts. Elm, you have to have two things. You got to define the type alias of the model. Like, what is it? It doesn't have to be a type alias. It could just be a type. But let's assume you're going to add a record very similar to you do in Redux, and your object's going to get bigger and bigger as your project grows, and you just learn new things and add new screens and add new features. So your type alias is a count of int. It's a single record with a property called count, and it's an integer. Now, when your app starts, you have to give some kind of initial model. Like, what are we starting from? What's the starting point? And that's initial model. You don't have to call it initial model. That's just a common convention that people do. They say, all right, here's the start. So you give it a record of count equals zero. Okay, so that's the two parts. That's how you define a model. This is not normally what it looks like. Usually it's a bunch of types, a bunch of type aliases. It could be for your business. If you're doing insurance, for example, it could be the different users, the different markets, the combinations between those, some of the rules, using types to enforce those rules. In such cases where we can't have a default account holder that doesn't exist, we have to have a default secondary account holder for legal reasons. Like you can type those situations to guarantee they can't possibly happen. So once you get your types in order, at that point, you're just doing UI development around that, right? Your types are good. Types can also recommend state. So for example, like if you have a checkbox, this is where if it's clicked or not goes. So low level things like that go here too. And you can tie those to records, UI states, whatever. But the point is, you need to be thinking about that. And then how does the user transition from screen to screen? Are they loading while they're waiting for data to load? That should be here too. Could be three states. Loading, it's successfully loaded, or I have no data, what do I do? All those things go in here. So this is when we talk about model, we're thinking of modeling, domain different design, creating the types around our app. Okay? So your entire app's going to go around that. And that's where your compiler helps you make sure your entire app's good. The view is what we're all excited about, like why we're front-end developers. This is where we get like just pumped, right? Elm has a function for UIs. So in Elm, everything's a function, which means that every HTML tag in existence is a function. And they have them all built in. So paragraph tag, it's just a P tag, right? P, you call P, it's function P, you import it in HTML. It has two things, what we're used to. It, attributes, right? The things like data attributes and styles. And whatever you put in that list is going to be on the P tag that it generates. So think like JSX and React. This would be the, very similar than that. You just, instead of a custom HTML framework, it's a function function with two parameters, attributes and contents. Contents would be like stuff that goes into p tag. So since this p tag has no attributes and no contents, it's literally just a paragraph tag. So see how it's like a paragraph tag? That's what that would output, okay? If we have a paragraph tag with text in it, then it's gonna generate a paragraph tag with text in it, <laughs> right? It makes sense. And so you could put comma in there, but for the most part, you have a paragraph tag with one thing like text, or maybe you have other paragraph tags nested in there, maybe bold tags, formatting, whatever, that's, that's fine. A div would be a good example where we have the style tag of color red, so that's an attribute. Then we have contents with text, so that would generate that kind of div with the attribute style equals color, right, red or whatever. Actually, that style should be red. So clearly Elm is better at generating HTML than I am in my examples. <laughs> now, web components, despite being a standard and lit HTML and all these others of trying to make them easier to use, almost all the frameworks kind of adopt the parts they like about web components, and that's components, the idea of a building block of a UI that does one thing, and then you kind of put these things together, compose them, put them inside of each other, put them inside of each other in the case of forms, for example. So here's a view example where we're going to, we want to create a button counter where we click a button and it counts things, right? And so you define the view component. You're very clearly saying, I'm going to create a component from this thing. And whatever the name is, a button counter, that's the name of it. And the data that it has internally is the count. But the template is the HTML that renders it. And the key interesting thing about the template, at least in this example, is that the functionality of clicking it and the changing of data in it is all in that template, okay? Now, you don't have to do that way in, in view, but also representing it with like the whole bracket bracket syntax, the handlebar syntax of count. All three of those mechanisms are in the template. And that's again, that's okay. I just want to illustrate that the data the functionality, the user event of clicking, the actual changing of the data and displaying data is all in that component. Now, when you want to use it, you say button counter as an HTML tag, and that's how you render to the screen, right? So that's how you do components in like Vue and Angular and React. They all have different mechanisms, but it's generally the same thing. Sometimes you don't put data in there. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you handle messages differently. But it's all the same idea of creating these little components, right? And Elm 
it's very similar. You have your own function, and that's your component. So button counter is a function, takes a model. Now you can put whatever you want in there. It can take no parameters. But generally, you put a model until you figure out what piece of the model you want. And so I have that function called button counter, takes a model, and I'm for now, I'm just gonna make it a button. So an HTML button, and when I on-click, I want it to increment. So that's a message. I want it to say, hey, I want to increment the data. And so the on-click will render out an HTML an on-click that will dispatch the increment message. The content is I want that button to have text on it, say you click me X amount of times, right? So the model is an integer, cool, but I gotta convert it to a string. So I say from int, it's short form for string.int, okay? When I wanna use it, I just call the function with the model. So that's how you use components in Elm. And I could put that in a P tag, I could put that in a div tag, I could put a bunch of them in there, right? It's the same concept of composing. The difference is that they're just functions, right, with types. So that's really the only difference. If you already know web components and things like that, you have a pretty good head start. It's just thinking, thinking functions. So messages, let's compare that. I think that will help. In Redux, they have this concept of an action. All that is is an object with a property of type as a string, and that's it. Normally, you'll have a ton of these things. Increment, decrement, reset, all the things you could possibly do with to account variable, right? And in Redux, that was originally started as just an object. Uh, eventually, it became an action creator where you have a function that creates it. And the reason for that was because if you wanted to parameterize that object that it returns. So you'd have a function that takes an amount and returns increment by this amount. It could be one, could be two, by three, whatever, right? And these are where the, the concepts of unit testing pure functions, people realized how easy it was to unit test pure functions because there was no need for stubs, no need for mocks, maybe a little bit of fixtures, but that was it, right? Really cool. So that's how you do it in Redux. And that increment function, you know, just returns an object and it's expected that at some point you're going to call that function with one of these values and then give it to a store dispatch, right? In view X, you commit that message. You say store commit, it'll run the mutation of increment and actually do the count plus plus or count plus whatever your amount is that you pass for increment. In NGRX, you would register that action and at some point later register the increment to some other function somewhere else that dealt with the data, right? In the RX chain style. And so that's the different ways that you would dispatch these messages to actually act on that data if you're not putting it inside the component. In React hooks, in some of the Angular components, if you have an internal state, you don't do any of this, right? Because you're, you have internal state like the view example. But if you're doing a stateful-based thing, that's how you would do a message. Elm has no internal state. You can't, everything's immutable. You can't mutate things, right? The model's there. So you have to use a message. And so that's just the key is if you're gonna use a message, how would you do it? Well, we saw we put it directly in the button, right? On click increment. So that's how you do it in the other frameworks. In Elm, you literally just do the message. And we saw on the button you added it, but what are the messages? Me think of messages as two things. Well, three things really. A, what are the messages that I can send? So increment and decrement, same thing I would do in Redux. It would just be type increment as a string, type decrement as a string and then your reducers would deal with those messages. In Elm, you define them as an or because you can only send a message. You can't send increment and decrement, right? It's an or, so I send increment, I send decrement. I send decrement, decrement, increment, increment, right? One message that you send. And so it's just a type you can choose from and, and we put it next to the on click. Whenever you click this button, I want you to send this message. It's also a place for recognizing scope creep. <laughs> so whenever your application gets really big, it's usually your messages get really, really long. Sometimes that's because you are trying to figure out what's the best way to allow the user to do things. I'm getting messages from the back end. I have different ways of the user to do the same functionality. So a different message, right? Which sometimes is appropriate. And it's also a way to recognize when you might want to start thinking about modularizing things. Now, modules are very also debatable topic in Elm because a lot of functional code with functions that are, you know, with types and helpful IDEs, you don't need to create 50 billion files. It's not like Java where you have to encapsulate a class per file, right? And again, no one can agree on code organization, but I feel like a lot of us functional programmers in Elm and in F Sharp and in Rescript too, you don't need that many modules, right? From encapsulation perspective. It's only when your UI development gets so large that it's like, dude, just put that gigantic UI that's a thousand lines of code in this one module and just say, the form, right? Like that's reasonable. And so messages are the same way. You start to get messages that 
are really only applicable to that part of the UI. So it's just easier to import them in that way. You don't have to. The component model is hard to break if you come from front end. So just be aware. All right. So that's how we dispatch the message. Now, when you have your model that's a type and the data and it's immutable and you're looking to change it, you have the view that can represent that model and allow the user to dispatch messages to do things, but it could come back from HTTP calls too. That's what the messages are. It's either the user wants to do something or the HTTP call came back with something or the WebSocket pushed a message or the JavaScript on the web page told me something because I'm looking for geolocation, right? Or whatever. That's the messages. How you change the model is in the update function. This is where the concept of immutable data comes from, where things like Imer and Redux are trying to make it simpler. Redux, uh, I think it's Reacts hooks for use reducer, for example, kind of simplifies that concept of making it from a, a immutable data perspective using a hook, right? So Redux, normal way of doing that in update was you would have your reducer called count, right? That's the name of the actual reducer. And you would have your initial model the state of count starts at zero. That's the default, but it's only ever called with undefined in, in the very beginning. Every other time it's, it's given the state that it is currently. So in this case, we're gonna start with zero because you got undefined, but every other time you call count, you're gonna have whatever it's one, two, three, or negative one, whatever. And then the action, what does your action creator send? What's that object type string equal, right? That's the object, the action is that object. And so what we're really interested in is the type on that. We're not gonna, in, 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 uh, we're not interested in amount right now. We're just saying, all right, are you a type of increment? Cool. Take the current state now and add plus one. So that's the immutability aspect. We're not mute. We're not going count dot plus plus, right? We're returning immutable data. So we're trying to think of that immutability perspective. The issue is JavaScript. Like, why would we ever get an action that isn't those? Now that could happen because we screwed up in our view. But if we didn't, we have to put this here just to satisfy a linting rule because JavaScript can't guarantee that all action types are increment and decrement only because there's no types. Now TypeScript could, if you had a type alias in TypeScript or an interface and you had the use strict on compile options, you could, you could deal with that, but it would still guarantee you'd have to have default sometimes, right? So this is an example of what Redux was doing. And this is where Imer is like, we got your back. You don't ever have to do this crap again. <laughs> we are trying to trying to like modify deeply nested state and you've never heard of like set in Lodash, for example. It's like, why should I have to use set in Lodash? Why can't I use native JavaScript? You go right ahead, Mr. Dot, 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 dot. <laughs> you have fun with that. So Imer's like, look, dude, just do this instead. You can just do count count. We know what you meant. You don't have to return anything and we'll figure it out. So it's, it's a good idea, right? I, 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 I like where they're coming from. I just, I don't think encouraging this behavior is okay, but it's, they view it as hard and I understand. View X, what they do is in that internal state, they'll separate the mutations. So they kind of co-locate it to the data, which is fine because sometimes your reducers really are that simple. They're incrementing the number or whatever, but even there they're doing that internal mutation, right? They're doing state.count. So there's no like concept of immutable data, which I find kind of frustrating. Elm, it's just an update function normally, right? And the update function gets a message and a model. So the message is what happened? Is it increment, decrement, something else? The model is what is the model right now? If you use the case expressions, you can guarantee that you cover every possible message. So as your app starts out, you only have two, right? Increment, decrement. But what happens when you have a reset, count, update, right? The case will guarantee that as you add new messages, you guarantee you handle them. The compiler won't let you do that until you handle all messages, which is fantastic. In this case, if increments, all we do is update the records. So this is how you do immutable record updates, very similar to destruction in JavaScript. We say the model, we just want to change this one property of count equals. So it'll take all the same model as it already is if it has a bunch of properties, just modify this one. So it's not actually mutating. It's just returning a new copy of that object with this one property change. So think like destruction in JavaScript or object out of sign. That'd be a good mental model. Decrement, complete opposite. Just minus is one, right? So again, this is where your update function will also start to mirror your message where it starts to get really big as you have a lot of message things. So it, it, it could help to encapsulate it, but just be careful because if you start having components and files, it gets kind of weird when you have messages going around, you'll see. That's how you update the data. That's the Elm architecture. And again, the whole reason we're doing this is to make our front end development more happy. We're just trying to be happier people. Happier people are generally have more positive emotions than negative and they have better life satisfaction. To get more happier emotions, you gotta get rid of all the negative things that JavaScript doesn't help you with the front end, specifically runtime exceptions, surprises. Undefined is not a function. 
digging through his stack trace, figuring out where the null pointer is. Is it from the front end, the back end? Is it me? Did I misspell something? I don't know. And no side effects. I don't have to worry about testing my code. I can literally, all my unit tests can focus on correctness and I can feel more confident about that. When I learn something, I can refactor with confidence. Because the compiler is so good and the types are so good, I can continue to add to that domain language in my types. And then as soon as I hit save, Elm will say, all right, here's all the places you need to update in your, your code. Not just the UI, but everything, the data, the updates, all that stuff. And so you have that fearless refactoring, which is just a wonderful thing about it. And keep in mind, every single compiler message is readable. It's not this weird esoteric of like random things that random lines of code. It tells you where it is, why, and sometimes gives you hints on how to fix it. So the Elm compiler messages are great. They're a wonderful tool. In one architecture, once you learn, I just got to create a message and put it in my UI, like that's it, you're done. And you never have to learn it again. So when you start doing this every day, like you never have to keep up to date on the Elm community's addition to the Elm architecture. <laughs> like those problems go away. Yes, it's still good to learn about it from React and, and Angular and Vue from a, and it's felt from a career perspective. But you won't have to do it now. Elm's got your back, right? So you can feel good that once you learn it, you're good. You never have to touch it again, and it'll continue to add value. So that's that should make you feel happy. Now, con contributions to learn more. I've got a lot of videos on if you just want to do a quick Elm app, just build it. I walk you through it. Really simple, really quick, two minute videos get you get you right into it. If you're looking for a deeper dive, obviously Jeremy, Jeremy's video is the best from like high level of video you just saw. But my beginner's guide kind of dives into the really aspects of it and nuances of messages and things like that. I don't compare it to JavaScript. It's like, this is Elm. This is how it works. This is what you do. Test room development in Elm is important because a lot of people, when they talk about TDD, they don't know how to do it. Like there's, there's a bunch of, like, how do I do it from scratch? Like, just show me. And so I did it from an object-oriented perspective. And when I used object-oriented, I had no types. It was just JavaScript. Elm was the strictly type functional language or soundly typed. And we did TDD with that. And people think, why do you test if the compiler is so good and whatever else? But you still want to have that correctness. Like, does the app work as I think it does? And so TDD and Elm is a good example of seeing how you can do that. And again, fast videos, two minutes, things like that. To me, the hardest thing in Elm really in learning was the JSON decoding. That really just for whatever reason, I would do it a lot, right? I would, I would actually get practice with it, but it just felt like the hardest thing. And so I made a video specifically on just decoding JSON and Elm because once you get that, that's what your most of our UI work is, right? Is talking to REST APIs and showing data and sending back and forth. The decoding and in, encoding, not so much, but the decoding, that's the hardest. And once you get it, once it clicks, you're good. You'll have some syntax and copy paste. It's, you're good. It's just, it, it, for whatever reason, for me, it, that was the hardest mountain to climb. Once I conquered that, I felt super confident. I think you will too. So the sample code is two apps I built, really small apps, but the, the temperature converter shows a, a really interesting challenge in Elm where you have bi-directional forms. So there's no bi-directional data in like MVC nowadays, or it's kind of gone away. But this is one where if you uh, type in one field, it affects the other. And so it's an interesting use case where sometimes we have interactive forms that affect each other. So now that you have a single source of truth, you get in the weird situation with models that have to be kept in sync, where if I update it here, this message has to tell hit. So it's a good example to read that. The retry calculator is just where I do basic form stuff. So there's source code there. And if you do step functions in AWS, it's actually helpful because the math is really hard. And if you're American, obviously <laughs> the temperature converter because the rest of the world uses a good thing called the metric system, not this nonsense we use called the Imperial. Books, uh, I wrote a book called Real World Functional Programming, and it's still in progress. I I'm, I'm, I'm probably won't finish the next chapter, like the last chapter for 10 years, and I probably should revisit the beginning, but it's not about using types. It's just the good parts of functional programming. So if you're not familiar with a lot of the stuff I talked about in this video, like currying and partial applications, pure functions, side effects, blah, 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 that'll give you enough where you can go in your existing JavaScript job, existing Python job, even Golang, and have benefits without being one of those weird <laughs> zealot functional programming programmers like me, right? It just gets you gets you working. So you can still keep your existing job. Um, the Elm Guide by Evan, it, like, so the Elm Guide in general is probably the best way to learn Elm. Like you read it multiple times, there was a very specific order. And if you look, the author has this like passive aggressive, like, dude, you really need to read this. You can't skip this section. And it's great, it's great. But 
I think it's gr- good if you read it and then you sometimes come back after a week and read it again. Like I've done that on multiple sections and it's really helped me understand better. And so a, a lot of the Elm God, you can read the same thing, come back, read it, and read it in order will teach you everything you need to know about Elm, which I think is fantastic. The programming Elm, Jeremy Fairbank book, um, this, this is the one I got. It, it's good because I like Jeremy's style. Like I, he's very just open and like a nice guy, very calm, down to earth. And so I, I like that, that concept. So I think it's a good book. The tools, Elm Live is, if you're used to, there's this thing called Elm Reactor. I, I, I've been doing it wrong for like five years and I've kind of given up. Elm Live to me works. Like you, you basically sell, save your code in Elm and it immediately refreshes, right? And so that's what I expect from Create React app, using the NGI CLI, the, the view CLI, right? You're just used to like saving your code and instantly refreshes in the browser, right? So Elm Live does the same thing. You save your album code and instantly refreshes and in the browser shows you compiler error too if you don't want to look in the terminal. So it's, it's fantastic. Elm Review is a really really interesting linter because you would think Elm doesn't need a linter, but there are cases where your code is unreachable, so it won't be compiled in, which is good, but they don't tell you. There's places where you should probably shouldn't do certain things in Elm. There's good reasons for it, and we've learned over the years. And so the review will tell you that as a nice linter, and you can configure those rules. So I, I've been, Elm review is really, really impressive. There's a lot of other libraries, but I think those two really will positively impact your life from an Elm perspective. And so my contributions are up top, but I definitely encourage you to look at the others too. They're just really, really fantastic. If you got any other questions about Elm, hopefully this gets you inspired. And remember the promise is that you don't have to worry about the runtime exceptions anymore, the null pointers. You can refactor with confidence. You can learn and feel excited to add that to your app, integrate and do the iteration without fear. That should make you feel really, really good. You got any other questions on Elm? Feel free to hit me up in the comments. I'm on Jester Excel on Twitter. I'll answer it there. I, believe it's improved my life and it'll definitely improve your your life as a front-end developer too